Welcome to a sermon by Jonathan Edwards entitled, Great Guilt, No Obstacle to the Pardon of the Returning Sinner. This Reformation MP3 audio resource is a product of Stillwater's Revival Books. Many free uh, Puritan and Reformed resources, as well as our complete online catalog, uh, containing classic and contemporary Reformation books, digital downloads, MP3s, videos, DVDs, CDs, and the Puritan hard drive at great discounts are on the web at puritandownloads.com. Also, please consider, pray, and act upon this important truth found in the following quotation by Charles Spurgeon. Quote, As the Apostle says to Timothy, so also he says to everyone, Give yourself to reading. He who will not use the thoughts of other men's brains proves that he has no brains of his own. You need to read. Renounce as much as you will all light literature, but study as much as possible sound theological works, especially the Puritanic writers and expositions of the Bible. The best way for you to spend your leisure is to be either reading or praying. If you'd like to be added to our email list, please send an email to swrb at swrb.com with the word add in the subject line. Our email list is a double opt-in list, so once you've sent us your email address, you'll be asked by email to confirm that you want to join our list using the email address you have supplied. Your email information will be kept confidential, and you can easily remove yourself from our email list by simply emailing us at swrb at swrb.com with the word remove in the subject line. Once you are on our email list, you'll be alerted to all the new free Reformation resources, free MP3s, free electronic books and texts that SWRB makes available on the web, as well as at times to our best discounts and super specials. We also encourage you to reproduce this audio resource and to pass it on to your friends, but we only authorize this as long as the full contents of the message including the header and trailer, is not altered in any way, and as long as the audio file is given away for free. And now to SWRB's reading of a sermon by Jonathan Edwards entitled, Great Guilt, No Obstacle for the Pardon of the Returning Sinner. We hope that you find this to be a great blessing. And we uh, hope that we'll draw you nearer to the Lord Jesus Christ. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. John 14.6 Great guilt. No obstacle to the pardon of the returning sinner. Psalm 25.11 For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. It is evident by some passages in this psalm that when it was penned, it was a time of affliction and danger with David. This appears particularly by the 15th and following verses. Quote, Mine eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net, and so forth. This distress makes him think of his sins and leads him to confess them and to cry to God for pardon, as is suitable in a time of affliction. See verse 7. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgression. And verse 18. Look upon my affliction and my pain, and forgive all my sins. It is observable in the text what arguments the psalmist makes use of in pleading for pardon. He pleads for pardon for God's name, God's name's sake. He has no expectation of pardon for the sake of any righteousness or worthiness of his for any good deeds he had done or any compensation he had made for his sins. Though If man's righteousness could be a just plea, David would have had as much to plead as most. But he begs that God would do it for his own namesake, for his own glory, for the glory of his own free grace, and for the honor of his own covenant faithfulness. Two, the psalmist pleads the greatness of his sins as an argument for mercy. He not only doth not plead his own righteousness or the smallest of his sins, He not only doth not say, pardon my iniquity, 
for I have done much good to counterbalance it, or pardon my iniquity, for it is small, and thou hast no great reason to be angry with me. And mine ang- iniquity is not so great, for thou hast any that thou hast any just cause to remember it against me. Mine offense is not such, but that thou mayest well enough overlook it. But on the contrary, he says, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. He pleads the greatness of his sin and not the smallness of it. He enforces his prayer with this consideration that his sins are very heinous. But how could he make this a plea for pardon? I answer because the greater his iniquity was, the more need he had of pardon. It is as much as if he had said, pardon my iniquity, for it is so great that I cannot bear the punishment. My sin is so great that I am in necessity of pardon. My case will be exceedingly miserable unless thou be pleased to pardon me. He makes use of the greatness of his sin to enforce his plea for pardon as a man would make use of the greatness of calamity in begging for relief. When a beggar begs for bread, he will plead the greatness of his poverty and necessity. When a man in distress cries for pity, what more suitable plea can be urged than the extremity of his case? And God allows such a plea as this, for he is moved to mercy towards us by nothing in us but the miserableness of our case. He doth not pity sinners because they are worthy, but because they need his pity. Doctrine, if we truly come to God for mercy, the greatness of our sin will be no impediment to pardon. If it were an impediment, David would never have used it as a plea for pardon, as we find he does in the text. The following things are needful in order that we truly come to God for mercy. Number one, that we should see our misery and be sensible of our need of mercy. They who are not sensible of their misery cannot truly look to God for mercy. For it is the very notion of divine mercy that it is the goodness and grace of God to the miserable. Without misery in the object, there can be no exercise of mercy. To suppose mercy without supposing misery or pity without calamity is a contradiction. Therefore, men cannot look upon themselves as proper objects of mercy unless they first know themselves to be miserable. And so, unless this be the case, it's impossible that they should come to God for mercy. They must be sensible that they are the children of wrath, that the law is against them, and that they are exposed to the curse of it, that the wrath of God abideth on them, and that he is angry with them every day while they are under the guilt of sin. They must be sensible that it is a very dreadful thing to be the object of the wrath of God, that it is a very awful thing to have him for their enemy, and that they cannot bear his wrath. They must be sensible that the guilt of sin makes them miserable creatures, whatever temporal enjoyments they have, that they can be no other than miserable, undone creatures, so long as God is angry with them, that they are without strength and must perish, and that eternally perish unless God help them. They must see that their case is utterly desperate for anything that anyone else can do for them that they hang over the pit of eternal misery, that they must necessarily drop into it if God have not mercy on them. Two, they must be sensible that they are not worthy that God should have mercy on them. They who truly come to God for mercy come as beggars, not as creditors. They come for mere mercy, for sovereign grace, and not for anything that is due. Therefore they must see that the misery under which they lie is justly brought upon them, and that the wrath to which they are exposed is justly threatened against them, and that they have deserved that God should be their enemy, and should continue to be their enemy. They must be sensible that it would be just with God to do as he hath threatened in his holy law, namely, make them the objects of his wrath, and curse in hell to all eternity. They who come to God for mercy in a right manner are not disposed to find fault with his severity, but they come in a sense of their own utter unworthiness. 
as with ropes about their necks and lying in the dust at the foot of mercy. Number three, they must come to God for mercy in and through Jesus Christ alone. All their hope of mercy must be from the consideration of what he is, what he hath done, and what he hath suffered, and that there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we can be saved but that of Christ, that he is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, that his blood cleanses from all sin, and that he is so worthy that all sinners who are in him may well be pardoned and accepted. It is impossible that any should come to God for mercy and at the same time have no hope of mercy. Their coming to God for it implies that they have some hope of obtaining, otherwise they would not think it worth the while to come. But they that come in a right manner have all their hope through Christ or from the consideration of his redemption and the sufficiency of it. If persons thus come to God for mercy, the greatness of their sins will be no impediment to pardon. Let their sins be ever so many and great and aggravated. It will not make God in the least degree more backward to pardon them. This may be made evident by the following considerations. First, the mercy of God is as sufficient for the pardon of the greatest sins as for the least, and that because his mercy is infinite. That which is infinite is as much above what is great as it is above what is small. Thus God being infinitely great, he is as much above kings as he is above beggars. He is as much above the highest angel as he is above the meanest worm. Our infinite measure doth not come any nearer to the extent of what is infinite than another. And so the mercy of God being infinite, it must be as sufficient for the pardon of all sin as of one. If one of the least sins be not beyond the mercy of God, so neither are the greatest, or ten thousand of them. However, it must be acknowledged that this alone doth not prove the doctrine for though the mercy of God may be as sufficient for the pardon of great sins as others, yet there may be other obstacles besides the want of mercy. The mercy of God may be sufficient, and yet the other attributes may oppose the dispensation of mercy in these cases. Therefore I observe, too, that the satisfaction of Christ is as sufficient for the removal of the greatest guilt as the least. First John 1, 7, the blood of Christ cleanseth from all sin. Acts 13.39 By him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. All the sins of those who truly come to God for mercy, let them be what they will, are satisfied for, if God be true who tells us so. And if they be satisfied for, surely it is not incredible that God should be ready to pardon them so that Christ, having fully satisfied for all sin, or having wrought out a satisfaction that is sufficient for all, it is now no way inconsistent with the glory of the divine attributes to pardon the greatest sins of those who in a right manner come unto him for it. God may now pardon the greatest sinners without any prejudice to the honor of his holiness. The holiness of God will not suffer him to give the least countenance to sin, but inclines him to give proper testimonies of his hatred of it. But Christ, having satisfied for sin, God can now love the sinner and give no countenance at all to sin, however great a sinner he may have been. It was a sufficient testimony of God's abhorrence of sin that he poured out his wrath on his own dear son when he took the guilt of it upon himself. Nothing can more show God's abhorrence of sin than this. If all mankind had been eternally damned, it would not have been so great a testimony of it. God may, through Christ, pardon the greatest sinner without any prejudice to the honor of his majesty. The honor of the divine majesty indeed requires satisfaction, but the sufferings of Christ fully repair the injury. Let the contempt be ever so great, yet if so honorable a person as Christ 
undertakes to be a mediator for the offender and suffers so much for him, it fully repairs the injury done to the majesty of heaven and earth. The sufferings of Christ fully satisfy justice. The justice of God, as the supreme governor and judge of the world, requires the punishment of sin. The supreme judge must judge the world according to a rule of justice. God doth not show mercy as a judge, but as a sovereign. Therefore, his exercise of mercy as a sovereign and his justice as a judge must be made consistent one with another. And this is done by the sufferings of Christ, in which sin is punished fully and justice answered. Romans three twenty five twenty six, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The law is no impediment in the way of the pardon of the greatest sin, if men do but truly come to God for mercy. For Christ hath fulfilled the law. He hath borne the curse of it in his suffering. Galatians 3.13 Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Three, Christ will not refuse to save the greatest sinners who in a right manner come to God for mercy, for this is his work. It is his business to be a savior of sinners. It is the work upon which he came into the world, and therefore he will not object to it. He did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Matthew 9:13. sin is the very evil which he came into the world to remedy. Therefore he will not object to any man that he is very sinful. The more sinful he is, the more need of Christ. The sinfulness of man was the reason of Christ coming into the world. This is the very misery from which he came to deliver men. The more they have of it, the more need they have of being delivered. They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick, Matthew 9, 12. The physician will not make it an objection against healing a man who applies to him that he stands in great need of his help. If a physician of compassion comes among the sick and wounded, surely he will not refuse to heal those that stand in most need of healing, if he's able to heal them. Number four, herein doth the glory of grace by the redemption of Christ much consist, namely in its sufficiency for the pardon of the greatest sinners. The whole contrivance of the way of salvation is for this end, to glorify the free grace of God. God had it on his heart from all eternity to glorify this attribute, and therefore it is that the device of saving sinners by Christ was conceived. The greatness of divine grace appears very much in this, that God, by Christ, saves the greatest offenders. The greater the guilt of any sinner is, the more glorious and wonderful is the grace manifested in his pardon. Romans 5.20 Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The apostle, when telling how great a sinner he had been, takes notice of the abounding of grace in his pardon, of which his great guilt was the occasion. 1 Timothy 1.13 Who was before a blasphemer? and a persecutor, and injurious, but I, Paul, obtained mercy, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant, with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. The Redeemer is glorified in that he proves sufficient to redeem those who are exceeding sinful, in that his blood proves sufficient to wash away the greatest guilt, in that he is able to save men to the uttermost, and in that he redeems even from the greatest misery. It is the honor of Christ to save the greatest sinners when they come to him, as it is the honor of a physician that he cures the most desperate diseases or wounds. Therefore, no doubt, Christ will be willing to save the greatest sinners if they come to him, for he will not be backward to glorify himself and to commend the value and virtue of his own blood, 
Seeing he hath so laid out himself to redeem sinners, he will not be unwilling to show that he is able to redeem to the uttermost. Number five, pardon is as much offered and promised to the greatest sinners as any, if they will come right to God for mercy. The invitations of the gospel are always in universal terms, as, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and whosoever will, let him come. And the voice of wisdom is to men in general, Proverbs 8, 4, Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men, not to moral men or religious men, but to you, O men. And so Christ promises John 6.37, Him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. This is the direction of Christ to his apostles after his resurrection. Mark 16.15 and 16, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, which is agreeable to what the apostle saith, that the gospel was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, Colossians 1, 23. Thus is the doctrine, and now the application. The proper use of this subject is to encourage sinners whose consciences are burdened with a sense of guilt immediately to go to God through Christ for mercy. If you go in the manner we have described, the arms of mercy are open to embrace you. You need not be at all. The more fearful of coming because of your sins, let them be ever so black. If you had as much guilt lying on each of your souls as all of the wicked men in the world and all the damned souls in hell, yet if you come to God for mercy, sensible of your own vileness and seeking pardon only through the free mercy of God in Christ, you would not need to be afraid. The greatness of your sins would be no impediment to your pardon. Therefore, if your souls be burdened and you are distressed for fear of hell, you need not fear and bear that burden and distress any longer. If you are but willing, you may freely come and unload yourselves and cast all your burdens on Christ and rest in Him. But here I shall speak to some objections which uh, some awakened sinners may be ready to make against what I now exhort them to. Number one, some may be ready to object, I have spent my youth and all the best of my life in sin, and I am afraid God will not accept of me when I offer him only my old age. To this I would answer, number one, hath God said anywhere that he will not accept old sinners who come to him? God hath often made offers and promises in universal terms, and is there any such exception put in? Doth Christ say, All that thirst, let them come to me and drink, except old sinners? Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, except old sinners, and I will give you rest. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out, if he be not an old sinner. Did you ever read any such exception anywhere in the Bible? And why should you give way to exceptions which you make out of your own heads, or rather which the devil puts into your heads, and which have no foundation in the word of God? Indeed, it is more rare that old sinners are willing to come than others. But uh, if they do, they are as readily accepted as any whatever. Number two, when God accepts of young persons, it is not for the sake of the service which they are like to do him afterwards, or because youth is better than worth accepting than old age. You seem entirely to mistake the matter in thinking that God will not accept of you because you are old, as though he readily accepted of persons in their youth because their youth is better worth his acceptance, where it is it's only for the sake of Jesus Christ that God is willing to accept of any. You say your life is almost spent, and you're afraid that the best time for serving God is past, and that therefore God will not now accept of you, as if it were for the sake of the service which persons are like to do him after they are converted that he accepts of them. But a self-righteous spirit is at the bottom of such objections. Men cannot get off from the notion that it is for some goodness or service of their own, either done or expected to be done, that God accepts of persons and receives them into favor. Indeed, 
They who deny God their youth, the best part of their lives, and spend it in the service of Satan, dreadfully sin and provoke God. And he very often leaves them to hardness of heart when they are grown old. But if they are willing to accept of Christ when old, he is as ready to receive them as any others. For in that matter God hath respect only to Christ and his worthiness. Secondly, you might be afraid you've committed sins that are peculiar to reprobates. I have sinned against light and strong convictions of conscience. I have sinned presumptuously and have so resisted the strivings of the Spirit of God that I am afraid I have committed such sins as none of God's elect ever commit. I cannot think that God will ever leave one whom he intends to save to go on and commit sins against so much light and conviction and with such horrid presumption. Others may say, I have had risings of heart against God, blasphemous thoughts, a spiteful and malicious spirit, and have abused mercy and the strivings of the Spirit, trampled upon the Savior. My sins are such as are peculiar to those who are reprobated to eternal damnation. To all this I would answer, one, there is no sin peculiar to reprobates, but the sin against the Holy Ghost. Do you read of any other in the Word of God? And if you do not read of any there, what ground have you to think any such thing? What other rule have we by which to judge of such matters but the divine word? If we venture to go beyond that, we shall be miserably in the dark. When we pretend to go further in our determinations than the word of God, Satan takes us up and leads us. It seems to you that such sins are peculiar to the reprobate and such as God never forgives. But what reason can you give for it if you have no word of God to reveal it? Is it because you cannot see how the mercy of God is sufficient to pardon or the blood of Christ to cleanse from such presumptuous sins? If so, it's because you never yet saw how great the mercy of God is. You never saw the sufficiency of the blood of Christ and you know not how far the virtue of it extends. Some elect persons have been guilty of all manner of sins except the sin against the Holy Ghost. And unless you have been guilty of this, you have not been guilty of any that are peculiar to reprobates. Two, men may be less likely to believe uh, for sins which they have committed and not the less readily pardoned when they do believe. It must be acknowledged that some sinners are in more danger of hell than others, though all are in great danger. Some are less likely to be saved. Some are less likely ever to be converted and to come to Christ. But all who do come to him are alike readily accepted. And there is as much encouragement for one man to come to Christ as another. Such sins, as you mentioned, are indeed exceeding heinous and provoking to God and do in an especial manner bring the soul into danger of damnation and into danger of being given to final hardness of heart. And God more commonly gives men up to be judged of final hardness for such sins than for others. Yet they are not peculiar to reprobates. There is but one sin that is so, namely that against the Holy Ghost. And notwithstanding the sins which you have committed, if you can find it in your heart to come to Christ and close with him, you'll be accepted, not at all the less readily, because you have committed such sins. Though God doth more rarely cause some sorts of sinners to come to Christ than others, it is not sufficient to say that because his mercy or the redemption of Christ is not as sufficient for them as others, but because in wisdom he sees fit so to dispense his grace for a restraint upon the wickedness of men, because it is his will to give converting grace in the use of means among which this is one, namely to lead a moral and religious life and agreeable to our light, and the convictions of our consciences. But when once any sinner is willing to come to Christ, mercy is as ready for him as for any. There is no consideration at all had of his sins. Let him have been ever so sinful, his sins are not remembered. God doth not upbraid him with them. 
Roman numeral three, but had I not better stay till I shall have made better of myself before I presume to come to Christ now? I, I have been and see myself to be very wicked now, but I am in hopes of mending myself and rendering myself at least not so wicked. Then I shall have more courage to come to God for mercy. In answer to this, first consider how unreasonably you act. You are striving to set up yourselves as your own Savior. You're striving to get something of your own on the account of which you may the more readily be accepted, so that by this it appears that you do not seek to be accepted only on Christ's account. And is not this to rob Christ of the glory of being your only Savior? Yet this is the way in which you are hoping to make Christ willing to save you. You can never come to Christ at all unless you first see that he will not accept of you the more readily for anything that you can do. You must first see that it is utterly in vain for you to try to make yourselves better on any such account. You must see that you can never make yourselves any more worthy or less unworthy by anything which you can perform. And thirdly, if ever you truly come to Christ, you must see that there is enough of him in him for your pardon, though you be no better than you are. If you see not the sufficiency of Christ to pardon you without any righteousness of your own to recommend you, you'll never come so as to be accepted of him. The way to be accepted is to come, not on any such encouragement that now you have made yourself better and more worthy or not so unworthy, but on the mere encouragement of Christ's worthiness and God's mercy. Number four, if ever you truly come to Christ, you must come to him to make you better. You must come as a patient comes to his physician with his diseases or wounds to be cured. Spread all your wickedness before him and do not plead your goodness, but plead your badness and your necessity on that account. And say, as the psalmist in the text, not pardon my iniquity, for it is not so great as it was, but pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan hard drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable, and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.